Welcome to another lively edition of The Deadly Experiment with your host and producer, Rick Adams. Ladies and gentlemen, um, as we continue program by program on uh, these venues, on uh, Rhode Island uh, cable television and particularly public access television, we also have the YouTube venue and we are exploring other options as well uh, in case. But our programs on YouTube are put together in a very, I think, professional manner and by our professional editing staff. And we appreciate the work that is done for the glory of God so that it will not be one of those kinds of examples where you see some raving lunatic or somebody who could be easily categorized as a nutcake or a whack job who's just totally off the wall. Although that doesn't stop many of our detractors from attempting to do just that because of the subject matter we deal with. Who could ever say years ago, except a handful of people in alternative independent media, that we weren't being told the truth about anything by the media? And yet, we weren't being told the truth about virtually anything by the media. We go back to the Great Depression and, and the time when we were told the New York Times and the Washington Post and uh, similar publications, the Boston Globe, that freedom and free enterprise was responsible for the Depression. Well, we found out later that that was not true at all. But Millions of Americans were corralled by media, motion pictures in newsreel form in the theaters, the press. There was very little alternative media at all then, and radio had been controlled to a large degree. We know Char uh, Father Charles uh, Coughlin was taken off the air by uh, the Vatican itself, bowing to the demands of the international criminal, bankster, gangster elite, the synagogue of Satan, because he was starting to step on some pretty sore toes. And unfortunately, we were the worst off because of it. He predicted the wars to come, World War II particularly, and the demagoguering of the politicians, particularly Roosevelt and his bought and paid for Republican opposition in the 1940 election. Ladies and gentlemen, it was happening a long time before now. It didn't just happen today. It didn't just happen with Trump, the media, the corrupt nutcake network, CNN News Factory, or ABC, NBC, CBS. This was going on for pretty near a century. And America didn't know any better except a few soothsayers like Charles Lindbergh and the America First Committee. Robert Welch, perhaps. Yes, Dan Smoot, definitely. And uh, a host of others who were speaking out against the encroachment on our independence, our nation's sovereignty, our freedoms, our liberties through economic and political and, yes, military excursions that would destroy, eventually destroy this nation. And here's where we are today at the very precipice of disaster like ancient Rome 2,000 years ago, fat and overstuffed, ugly and overextended, now ready to collapse. Well, who brought us there? Again, we go back to the Word of God in the synagogue of Satan. We go to the book of Genesis to see the serpent, the serpent seed who deceived and beguiled Eve, the mother of all who would live. That's what Eve means. And, uh, of course, the word is expartio, in the Greek, expartio means to wholly seduce, seduce sexually too. There was no apple on that tree that God said, do not partake of, my friends. We go from Genesis, we go to the books, the Gospels of Matthew and John, where John particularly identifies the synagogue of Satan. When Jesus is directly quoted as the confrontation that he had with those scribes and Pharisees who called themselves Israel but were not. They infiltrated the Levitical priesthood, however, many years before that. They took over through the Rechabites. They came in through the Nethanims, the workers who would build the temple for Solomon. But they were not of Israel. 
They were not of Israelite stock, you see. They took over the priesthood. So then when it came time to murder Jesus, they were the ones who did it. They weren't Israelites. The Israelite people took off when Jesus was being killed. Only Mary and the other Mary, two women, stood there. All the men took off. They were afraid of the, what? For fear of the Kenites, the Jews. Ladies and gentlemen, this is very deep. You're not getting fed in your churches. Come out of the churches, please. Let them fall and let them go bankrupt. Get into the word. That's what counts. Jesus is not very happy with those churches. Five out of seven churches that he judges in the book of Revelation. And Laodicea is among the top ones. Ephesus, Pergamos, Sardis, and so forth. He's only happy with two churches. The church of Philadelphia and Smyrna. Why? Because they knew who the Kenites were. Those who claim to be of our brother Judah and are not, but do lie. And are of the synagogue of Satan. He also, they also knew that uh, all the souls created in this age, human flesh, did not come from two people in that garden, Adam and Eve. Otherwise, we'd all be a different color. It would be impossible, scientifically, to get black people, to get all the different races, the mongrelized races and so forth, from two white people. And so that myth has been shattered. And most of all, the rapture theory, the rapture of the so-called church that does not exist. The word church is not in the Bible. The word ecclesia or called out ones is in the scriptures. So who's deceiving us and how? They do it through media. The Great Depression of the 1930s was not caused by, quote, capitalism. It was caused by socialism, by interventionism, by the Federal Reserve private banking system that set up the corrupt money system and then jammed on the brakes just after it had inflated everything and precipitated a huge stock market rise. But some knew that it was going to collapse. One of them, of course, who was an investor was Winston Churchill. He was one who wined and dined on the eve of the great collapse of the stock market crash of 1929. And, of course, he was uh, installed as the prime minister during those infamous war years of World War II for his just and faithful service to Satan. Roosevelt came in on the ashes of those like Hoover before him and Calvin Coolidge, who are actually one of them. Hoover was a Fabian socialist himself. He did not believe in free market capitalism, although he had some good qualities compared to Roosevelt. But when Roosevelt came in, of course, he ushered in a whole new dependency state, the New Deal, which was taken from uh, Germany's National Socialism and Italy's fascism, ironically. So we weren't really fighting fascism. We were enshrining it. Why? Because it created a state level of control. The state would be in control of everything economically, eventually. And that's where we are today, with Americans more dependent now on transfer payments than ever before. About 80 percent, or 75 at least, are now dependent on some form of transfer of money to their bank account from government or another form of assistance. That's where they want you, because Satan's going to come controlling you economically, you see. So from the Great Depression and World War I and its ensuing debacles comes World War II. And Hollywood, once again, and the media come to the rescue of people who are exposing what was happening in the European theater and how America was thrust into that war and the result was the Soviet empire enlarged its slave camp, killing tens of millions of souls, and then communist China, killing upwards of another 70 million souls in China, mainland China, through Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai, all the result of America's intervention in World War II. Right now, we are going to get into a segment of a documentary that deals with the mythology of how these sets, these so-called Holocaust sets, had been created by people like producer and director Billy Wilder in Hollywood. He used to appear on a number of TV shows, Jack Benny Show and so forth. He went to Europe after the war and reconstructed the so-called Holocaust narrative. This is just one example of what we hear and what was done to deceive your mind and 
And today, it's deceived more than ever before. Let's watch it. A propaganda film is made under the guise of making a documentary. It shows how a thousand people from the nearby city of Weimar are led into the Buchenwald camp in order to show them what the Nazis have done via the table. The film will portray the Germans as walking to the camp smiling, but after they are shown the table items, they leave the camp crying and shocked. What the Weimar citizens really think is irrelevant. They are essentially extras in the movie. For instance, this blonde woman looking at the lamp may be shaking her head in disbelief. These women wonder why the camera is on them. The people have just had their city taken over by a foreign army, which is now forcing them to walk four miles to Buchenwald. They couldn't be happy. However, the film crew needs a shot of the crowd smiling, so they say something or do something in a jeep driving by to get that, though not all of them fall for it. Twelve hundred civilians walked from the neighboring city of Weimar to begin a forced tour of the camp. There are many smiling faces, and according to observers, at first the Germans act as though this was something being staged for their benefit. The psych warfare goal of the film is to instill guilt and shame into the German population in order to denazify them. Previous to seeing this camp, the citizens of the city of Weimar had a sense of righteous indignation because the Nazi government had told them that the Americans and British deliberately bombed residential housing, killing hundreds of thousands of women, children, teenagers, babies, and old people. It was, unfortunately, true. Psych warfare needs to take away their victim status mentality by convincing them that the Nazis did something worse. As the cameras are rolling, the German citizens of Weimar are told to gather around the table. A reporter from the New York Times is also there. His front page article will be titled, Nazi Death Factory Shocks Germans on a Forced Tour. In the article we read, the visitors stood in lines, one group at a time passing by the table on which the exhibits were displayed. A German-speaking American sergeant explained from an adjacent jeep what they were witnessing, while all around them were thousands of liberated slaves just looking on. Even the barracks roof was crowded with them. Here are the inmates surrounding the Germans. Someone is holding up a human pelvis, telling the people it's a human pelvis ashtray. It's another problematic prop. For instance, as a bone, I'm not really sure if a human pelvis really lends itself to being an ashtray so well. Secondly, if you do a Google book search on the 400-page Buchenwald report written by the inmates themselves, you won't find anyone mentioning a human pelvis ashtray. Third, if the pelvis came from a cremation oven, it would have ash on it from that, but not cigarette ash. Thus, cigarette ash needs to be preserved on it for evidence, but holding it up to the crowd like this will scatter any ashes it may have had on it. Also, I'm not seeing dark ash stains against white bone. And the alleged human pelvis ashtray disappeared after its presentation here, just like the other problematic props. We freeze the footage and look in the background. This hat isn't any old hat. It's a general's helmet. It has one star, meaning that he's a one-star general, in the same way that in different footage we see General Patton has three stars and General Bradley has four stars. This general is likely the chief of Allied Psych Warfare. <laughs> 
a one-star general named Robert A. McClure, a photo of whom we find in the book Psych War. And here's McClure with his direct supervisor, Eisenhower. Compare the facial line at the side of the mouth. And guess who the guy is who held up the human pelvis ashtray? C.D. Jackson, his deputy. Remember the name C.D. Jackson. Fast forward 16 years. If you're good at putting forth a hoax with your psychological propaganda skills, should it follow as a natural progression that you end up as publisher of Life magazine? Because what it kind of looks like is that you're using your psychological propaganda skills to manipulate the American people. And one moment you're holding up a human pelvis ashtray to a crowd, and the next moment you're hanging out with General Eisenhower on the presidential campaign trail. Eisenhower opens Jersey Tour today, arrives here to begin two-day bid, first in the state by a GOP nominee since 1940. The aides included C.D. Jackson, editor of Fortune magazine. Then Eisenhower gets elected president, and we read, Eisenhower picks a Cold War chief. Names C.D. Jackson, New York publisher, and moved to spur psychological operations. Eisenhower hasn't even been president for a month, and he's got Jackson on board as his special assistant. That's because Jackson and McClure helped create the Holocaust myth, without which Eisenhower could not have been elected president. Three months later, C.D. Jackson is on board the presidential yacht. President Eisenhower returned to the Capitol today after what he described as a grand ride on the yacht Williamsburg, on which he had cruised to Williamsburg, Virginia. During the weekend cruise, the president worked on the report to the nation he will make by radio at 10.30 p.m. tomorrow. He was aided by C.D. Jackson, an expert in psychological and media manipulation, helping to write a speech for the American people. Here's some charts in the book Psych War showing how McClure, Jackson, and Eisenhower are connected. While McClure and Jackson set up their psychological warfare operation at Buchenwald, Eisenhower did his part to actively promote it. In David Hackett's book we read, But it is clear that Eisenhower was the essential catalyst in organizing the publicity barrage. Down the page we read, Eisenhower was still so disturbed by what he had seen that the atrocities again became the major topic of conversation when he met Prime Minister Churchill in London a few days later. Eisenhower spent a long evening with Churchill discussing the state of the war and visited him the next morning at the annex to 10 Downing Street, the War Rooms. Eisenhower promised to send photos of the camps to Churchill, who apparently shared his outrage. He urged Churchill to send a group of members of Parliament and journalists to tour the camps at once. An American delegation, Eisenhower feared, might be too late to see the full horrors, whereas an English delegation, being so much closer, could get there on time. In short, Eisenhower made sure disinformation entered the American and British media. General McClure stayed on after the war as head of info control. This article tells us about a letter he wrote. The Information Control Department had a wide-ranging charter. Indeed, as McClure wrote to his friend and Vice President of Time Life Incorporated, C.D. Jackson, in July 1946, We now control 37 newspapers, 6 radio stations, 314 theaters, 642 movies, 101 magazines, 
237 book publishers, 7,384 book dealers and printers, and conduct about 15 public opinion surveys a month, as well as publish one newspaper with a 1.5 million circulation. Three magazines run the Associated Press of Germany, Dana, and operate 20 library centers. The job is tremendous. When he said 642 movies, he meant 642 movie theaters, where the Buchenwald propaganda film can be shown. McClure and Jackson both have media power, but who's just below? It's William Paley, owner of CBS Radio Network and later CBS Television Network. It's like Edward Herman and Noam Chomsky's book, Manufacturing Consent, except it's manufacturing con. Every American down there likely believes the Holocaust is a historic fact, and if you were to ask them to give a reason why, they'd probably be taken aback by such a request. But when they thought about it for a moment, the main evidence they would offer is the piles of bodies which American troops found when they liberated the camps. We'll show that the reason Americans believe the piles of bodies are the biggest evidence for the Holocaust is because of Dwight D. Eisenhower. Then we'll show why the piles of bodies are not evidence for the Holocaust at all. First, some excerpts about Eisenhower at a camp. As they moved into the final weeks of the war in Europe, Allied soldiers were sickened and infuriated to discover Nazi concentration camps in which millions had been murdered or starved to death. Appalled at these sadistic revelations, Eisenhower quickly exposed the grim sights to the world. George Patton himself forced German civilians to look upon the gut-riching, heartbreaking scenes. The footage showed Eisenhower at the Ordruff camp, which is the first camp the Americans discovered. It was found seven days before Buchenwald was liberated. We look up Ordruff at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum and read, When the soldiers of the 4th Armored Division entered the camp, they discovered piles of bodies. Some covered with lime. They see the woodshed where lime-covered bodies are stacked in layers and the stench is overpowering. Same pile from a different angle. And others partially incinerated on pyres. The general and his party next see the crude woodland crematory, actually a grill made of railway tracks. Here, the bodies of victims were cremated. Charred remains of several inmates still lay heaped atop the grill. The ghastly nature of their discovery led General Dwight D. Eisenhower, Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces in Europe, to visit the camp on April 12th. The murder mill at Ordorf brings out the full horror and bestiality of the Nazi scum. And General Eisenhower, a man hardened by the blood and shock of war, seems appalled at these unbelievable sights. Accompanied by General Bradley on his revolting mission, and also by General Patton, hard-boiled yet visibly moved, the Supreme Commander sees demonstrations of the torture racks. After his visit, Eisenhower cabled General George C. Marshall, the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in Washington, describing his trip to Ordruff. The most interesting, although horrible, sight that I encountered during the trip was a visit to a German internment camp near Gotha. The things I saw beggar description. While I was touring the camp, I encountered three men who had been inmates and by one ruse or another had made their escape. I interviewed them through an interpreter. The visual evidence and the verbal testimony of starvation, cruelty, and bestiality were so overpowering as to leave me a bit sick. In one room where they were piled up twenty or thirty naked men, killed by starvation, George Patton would not even enter. He said that he would get sick if he did so.
I made the visit deliberately in order to be in a position to give first-hand evidence of these things if ever, in the future, there develops a tendency to charge these allegations merely to propaganda. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think you will admit that these questions and facts that are brought forth on this uh, documentary page about World War II and the aftermath and the creation of the Holocaust narrative certainly pose some very serious issues for our time that we were lied to and deceived in a way on a grand scale that the world had never been deceived before. World War I, remember, was the war that we were sold on as the war to end all wars. A preposterous notion, of course, brought to you by, the, again, the same synagogue of Satan that profited from the Depression just a few years before that. And it had been the result of creating the Federal Reserve Banking System in America in 1913, along with the direct election of senators, that's right, we didn't elect senators up until 1913. The Constitution forbade it. Why? Because senators would then be like Sheldon Whitehouse today, bought and paid for by all the corrupt special interests, instead of being appointed by your legislature, which there's enough corruption in to begin with, but at least you could control your state local offices, more so than you can Washington. The Founding Fathers had a lot of wisdom, didn't they? We don't have any today. Instead, we've got White House and Reed and Langevin and Cicilline. We predicted the results of that election in 2018, didn't we? Sure did. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad that you've seen this example now of how we've been lied to and deceived from World War I, even before it, the Great Depression, okay, uh, after it, rather, I'm sorry, after World War I, the Great Depression of 1930s, after the stock market collapse. And uh, prior to that, we saw a couple of politicians, presidents, speaking out against the creation of the central banking system, which was, uh, in one case, uh, President McKinley. President uh, William McKinley was assassinated. Uh, his assassins um, were at work on behalf of the international bankers from Europe. Again, the Rothschild regime. Um, and the uh, Schiff brothers, the Schiff brothers that had also, whose fathers brought us the civil war in America, you see? Brother against brother, north against south. Israelite against Israelite. The northern kingdom and the southern kingdom in America slash true Israel. Folks, these are the Kenites, the sons of Cain. Now you can see how they could take their own, like Billy Wilder, and go to Hollywood in Europe, in Germany, and recreate a whole narrative of World War II that was definitively false. Doesn't take very much but control of the media. That's why independent media today and these programs are a threat to them because they make you see an alternative. You can either accept us or you can reject it, but at your own, at your own peril or blessing. That's up to you. Fact is, history is true, if it's true history. Unfortunately, much of what parades as history today is neither historical nor is it true. Remember that. You are being lied to on a daily basis. Most of all, the prophecies reveal that the man of sin, Satan himself, will come posing as Jesus to bring peace and prosperity to a dying world. That's going to be coming out of Jerusalem. So now you understand the past lies and you'll understand what's coming, the biggest lie of all. Thank you for joining us today on The Deadly Experiment. We appreciate your patronage, your uh, prayers most of all, and your continued uh, watching and understanding things like you've never understood them before. This is the time, folks. The time of the end. Rick Adams, your producer and host for The Deadly Experiment, saying goodbye and may Yahweh bless his elect. <laughs>